you know, when you organize a discussion, um, then you pray that it's the weather is going to hold, and the rest of the time you pray that it's going to rain. So today, the whole day, I was looking at the weather and feeling for Madhu and thinking, it's going to rain any time, it's going to rain any time. It didn't rain, and then at 5.30, it started to rain. So as I was driving here, I was thinking, poor Madhu, she must be worrying, but it's great to see all of you. So thank you very much. Um, it's, um, it's an important discussion today on uh, the subject of how rape laws construct sexuality. It's not every day that you get a bunch of head honcho feminists sitting and talking and reflecting Yay! On, <laughs> on work that they have been involved in. So we have here, I don't think really I need to introduce these feminists to any of you, but nevertheless, uh, because that's the moderator's job, Shohini Ghosh, who's professor at Jamia, who is a writer, essayist, uh, involved in a whole range of uh, things. Uh, Rebecca John, who's a lawyer advocate who has some good news to report about an important case that she has been fighting for a young man called Kanhiya Kumar. Um, Madhu Mera, who is the Karta Dharta of uh, Partners for Law and Development and who's been uh, instrumental or has initiated the setting up of a really amazing archive and making a late and important entry is um, Farah Nakli, a writer, journalist, many other things. And what actually all of these women have in common is their long involvement in the women's movement in India and alongside it, or as an integral part of it, in what we uh, call broadly the civil liberties movement uh, in India. You know, giving weight to the fact of this word that is often used in academia in the West and in feminist movements in the West, which is as if it's a new discovery, something called intersectionality, which uh, women in this country have been practicing in the women's movement for the longest time because they haven't ever seen that activism as something that is separate from and disconnected to or with other aspects of our lives. The trigger for this evening's discussion is a small book that PLD has brought out, which is called The Rape Law and the Construction of Sexuality, uh, which Madhu will tell you more about, and which is available um, on the net and also in physical copies. And I think what we are really looking at is that there has, as you know, been a long involvement of women's groups in making a consistent and long-standing push for changes in the law on rape. You see two major aspects of it in the early 80s and then around 2013 when some major changes in the law come about. But the question that we are now posing is, and it's a question or these kinds of questions have been discussed inside closed circles in uh, the women's movement, but have seldom been discussed in public, that in the consistent focus on the law, have we in many ways allowed the law to construct women's sexuality, women's autonomy, their right to bodily integrity in particular ways? Have we in feeling a sense of achievement and a sense of uh, positivity in the enhanced and um, improved, if you like, definitions of what sexual violence is, what consent is, what women's bodily autonomy is, what their rights are, in looking at how these have changed over the years, have we kind of lost sight of the fact that those who practice the law, those who implement um, the processes that lead to the law, still retain in their minds, in their heads, the baggage of marriage, virginity, victimhood, purity, and so on, that so informed the old laws. 
even with the changes in the definition of consent, which now gives the woman a lot of agency to say whether she consented or not. But that agency, in order to be properly understood, is linked to an understanding of a woman as a sexual being, as a citizen, as a free person who has the right to decide her life. And if that understanding does not inform the way the law looks at her as the subject of uh, what they're doing, then where can we be expected to go? So there are certain areas that this research, this book tackles. And it also asks the question then, what are the limits of law? And is law sufficient unto itself? Or must we look elsewhere? And if we look elsewhere, how must we do that? What must we look at? So how we're going to construct this evening's discussion is that um, Madhu will start by giving you an introduction to the book and expanding on the points that I have taken from what uh, she has put together in the book. We will then move on to Rebecca, uh, who will address the question of the law. Then to Farah, who will look at the law as it applies and not necessarily the rape law, but also the Prevention of Atrocities Act, which is something that's discussed in detail in this book in relation to the whole notion of what atrocity is and how it is understood in relation to history and historical discrimination and so on. And then we'll move on to Shohini, who will uh, look at the idea of consent and the discussions around that. Each of the speakers will take about seven minutes or so to 